Behind the scenes in dirt late model racing, shocks have been a recent point of contention with both national tours taking a stand. We'll explain the situation today and go deep on the technical side. Let's go. It's Wednesday, January 24th. I'm Justin Fiedler. This is Dirt Tracker Daily. At Golden Isles tonight, the late model teams will have a chance to get on track for practice in advance of the Lucas Oil Late Model Dirt Series season opener. That begins on Thursday. Golden Isles will host full race programs Thursday through Saturday with 10,000, 12,000, and 25,000 win shows coming up. This will be our first chance to see the Lucas team is in action following some guys already getting started at Vado for the Wild West Shootout and last weekend's Outlaw opener at Volusia. There has been a lot of testing going on as well down south with cars on track recently at Golden Isles and East Bay. At this moment, we're probably looking at 13 Lucas full-timers with Hudson O'Neill, Ricky Thornton Jr., Devin Moran, Tim McCready, Dalton Wilson, Tony Jackson Jr., Ross Robinson, Earl Pearson Jr., Daniel Adam, Max Blair, Boom Briggs, Tyler Erb, and Garrett Alberson all expected to sign on. Others are still in play as well, like Jonathan Davenport, who we talked about yesterday, and there's apparently some chance uh, that Spencer Hughes and JCM could sign on if Speed Weeks go well. We'll see if there are any others uh, as Speed Weeks progresses. As we talked about yesterday, also don't uh, expect Brandon Overton to be in the mix for the full year. He will be in attendance this weekend, though, and a year ago he won two of these three races. I'd expect healthy car counts uh, all weekend. We had low 50s a year ago, and I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be the case again in 2024. Doesn't appear as though there will be any live coverage of tonight's practice, so we'll have to keep an eye on social media and my race pass for any updates. As for some of the ongoing late model tech issues, the Daily Show on Tuesday was focused on dirt late model bodies coming out of Volusia. Specifically, we talked about that photo of Devin Moran's car. On that show, I also mentioned that there was some shock stuff that was happening, and I wanted to dive more into that today. I was alerted to the situation last week uh, from a fairly prominent late model person, and the Hunt the Front guys talked about it on their podcast last Friday. I would recommend checking that out, and I'm going to kind of expand on what they said, you know, at least in an explanatory way. There were also some interesting Facebook posts around this subject about 10 days ago from various parties. I'm sure you could find those if you didn't, if you searched not all that hard, or uh, maybe you've already seen them. There's a specific type of shock that has now had its legality clarified under the unified rules. And verbiage has been added to both the World of Outlaws and Lucas rulebooks. This was an area that was uh, previously somewhat ambiguous on the definition, and some shock manufacturers, Bill Stein, Penske, and Fox, uh, I believe, had developed parts that fell into this gray area. We're going to kind of go a little, quote, inside baseball here to try to explain some of this. And I'm, I'm going to say up front, I am not a shock expert, but I've spent a bunch of time talking to people today who are shock experts, and I'm going to attempt to pass on what I've learned about the situation. I'm going to try and present this information without bias here, as I personally don't have a stance on all of this. I know a lot of people do, uh, but I think it's an interesting illustration of this kind of constant back and forth between the innovators trying to find speed in these gray areas and those who make the rules. So via the current dirt, uh, dirt light model rules, a type of shock called a through rod shock is not allowed. In the unified car construction document under se uh, section 10 subsection I for shock absorbers, the old rules said explicitly through rod shocks are not permitted, but the definition of what was or wasn't a through rod shock was not specified. A normal monotube shock has a rod or a shaft that exits one end of the body. And if you look at the screen, these are a couple of examples. The one you can actually see the oil inside as the shock compresses and decompresses that rod moves in and out of the body itself. With a through rod shock, that rod uh, actually passes through both ends of the body. So here's where we're going to get really technical. Shocks obviously filled with oil. As that rod enters the shock body where the oil is, a problem is created. That rod itself takes up space or volume and it puts that oil under pressure. Think about if you were to fill a cup with water, then dump something solid into that cup. Uh, you know, you were to throw rocks in it. The water then moves up the cup or possibly overflows out. That's the displacement. Monotube shocks account for this with a gas chamber uh, somewhere. And if you look at uh, next to me here, down there, that's the gas chamber right there in this specific shock. Uh, that allows for the oil pressure to be reduced as the rod takes up space. It doesn't eliminate the problem completely, but it certainly helps. A through rod shock, though, doesn't have this pressure problem, and it doesn't because the rod is always in the body and in the oil. In our water cup example, think about those solid objects always being there, not dumped in suddenly. The rod's displacement is always the same inside the body, so no added pressure is ever created. And these right here on the screen, if you look this way, these are a couple of examples of through rod shocks. And if you look at the very top there, 
and there you can kind of see where the rods would protrude out the top of them. The rod is able to effectively move freely in and out of both ends of the shock body, and this can be helpful in motorsports applications uh, because that pressure created inside a monotube shock actually adds some small measure of spring rate, which can create grip problems. That pressure in the body is actually trying to force the rod back out of it. As I've been told, the difference between the two shock types is basically nullified on a gripped up racetrack, but through rod shocks uh, work better on slicked off racetracks. Not having the added spring rate changes supposedly makes the tire have a more consistent contact patch to the racetrack. So here's where the definition is a bit gray. On traditional three rod shocks, you can actually see where the rod passes through the body, like you can see on the screen. It's exposed, pretty clear what it is, but some of the manufacturers were effectively capping this area so that the rod wasn't exposed. It was inside some sort of housing uh, and being called through rod technology. And these are the two images that were shared. The kind of illustration of the black one over here is the Bilstein version. And then this one is the Penske version. These images were shared on social media. But now the series have added extra verbiage to that through rod section of the rule book. The first says that the shaft or rod can not exit both sides of the oil volume. And the second basically says that the shaft can't pass through the main body on both ends. So this closes that loophole and makes some of these shocks now illegal. This verbiage was added here very recently within the last week or two. The Hunt the Front guys talked about the added cost of having more shocks to choose from, but as I was told, these through rod versions are, you know, near the same price as traditional late model shocks. And they won't necessarily replace other types, but give teams more options. There's also some thought that the tire wear will be helped by this technology, but some have pushed back against that, including the HTF guys in their video. I'm in no way qualified enough to have an opinion on that. I just wanted to point it out. As for the teching process, which was also brought up by Hunt the Front, it shouldn't be particularly difficult or require a teardown of the shock. It seems pretty clear from the research I've done what is and what isn't one of these pieces. And in speaking to some series people, they haven't made one particular manufacturer or piece illegal here. They just clarified the verbiage. And they will be on the lookout for these uh, as the season starts. I do think, though, this brings up some interesting issues where, again, at an intersection where we have innovation to make speed plus fairness and cost kind of all coming together. And decisions made here have rippling effects. Do things like these shocks mean more cost for teams or less? Kind of really depends on what side you ask that question to. I know this all may have been confusing. I hope I explained it as, uh, as well as I could. Uh, but again, another example of where teams are looking for speed within the rules. As I heard someone say once, it's not only about what the rules say, it's also about what the rules don't say. Hope this was informative. Feel free to leave your comments below. Uh, out in California, there might be hope for the future of Calistoga Speedway. This has kind of been a years long saga at this point, and even this little bit of good news doesn't necessarily guarantee anything or give us some sort of date to wait for. But as of this week, the city of Calistoga has purchased the 70 acre fairgrounds the racetrack sits on from Napa County. They got the property for the bargain basement price of $2 million. The county does retain the right to repurchase the fairgrounds if the city decides to rezone the property for other usage or to try to sell it or lease it. Via the deal, the city of Calistoga has committed to using the property as it has been in the past for things like fairs, events, the RV park, golf course, community services, and also the racetrack. At this point, that's really the bulk of the information we have. And uh, while nothing definite about the Speedway was revealed, it's at least good news that the track isn't being demolished for something else. Uh, we'll see how quickly the city can get things rolling with the fairgrounds. Around the other dirt racing podcast this week, uh, the Dirt Tracks and Rib Racks, uh, or Dirt Tracks and Rib Racks has Gage Green, Hoagie's Garage has Brant O'Banion and more. Doing which on Dirt has Daniel Adam and Kelly Carlton. Turn 2 Terribles has Brad Strasser. Racing Roundup has Logan Wagner, Plum Wild has Connor New, and there are new episodes of The Dirt Reporters and The Rigsby Report from Dirt Under and Flow Racing, Dirt Track Confessions, and Ohio Dirt. There's also a new show on the podcast page this week, The Hammer Lane from Joe Burridge and Paul Gower. They focus on sprint car racing around the country. To see the full list of shows and episodes, uh, visit dirttracker.com slash podcasts. Uh, that's it for The Daily Show today. Head over to dirttracker.com slash the slider and sign up for our free email newsletter. I've got a fresh piece from Pat Sullivan ready to go that I will send out here very soon. Hope you guys have a great Wednesday out there. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.